Hi, everybody. I'm David Chernoff. Um, okay, so we have a really full agenda today. What I want to present to you and invite some discussion on is not so much a study, but rather a series of NSF-funded studies on using educational video games to teach undergraduate mechanical engineering courses. And there were two different games. The first is a, um, a car racing game called EDU Torx. And the second is a driving, um, it's a game driving a subterranean vehicle to navigate challenges called Spumoni. <clears throat> I will demo both and give you some of the research findings on both. And along the way, we'll talk about some of the advantages and challenges of using an ed educational video game. And then the most recent study was on transportability. So uh, once you know a game is working the way you want and having the educational effects you want, the ability to transport it to other teachers and schools. This gets into the issues of implementation, and so I'd like to get some of your thoughts on that as well. Um, most of these studies have been published. Um, some have been presented at conferences, and so just so you have the references of those, I'm going to now post that into the chat, if that's okay. Okay, did you guys get that? I think so, All right? Um, so those are references for you if you would like further information. And we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so these studies were uh, investigated not only by me, but by my research collaborator, uh, Brianno Collar. Um, Brianno is a mechanical engineering professor at Northern Illinois University and is the brain behind creating the games. Um, my role as more of an educational psychologist was to lead the studies of engagement and learning. Brianna created these games as a tool that he believed could help him to teach undergraduate mechanical engineering courses better than the traditional textbook and lab approach. <clears throat> he, he realized that the reason most people are interested in mechanical engineering in the first place is they like to design and build things. And so he sought to give them experiences experiences much more like that of a real mechanical engineer, uh, which is a lot different than a textbook approach. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. Um, okay, so in the first study, we asked a simple question. Was a video game approach to teaching mechanical engineering instruction associated with higher motivation and engagement than the traditional approach lying on textbook problem solving in a sample of undergraduate college students. Um, so um, I'd like to uh, throw this out for your um, participation now. Um, why games? Um, I, can, I can give you some of our answers for why we pursued this avenue. But what are some, what are some unique advantages and educational um, of educational video games that you've found or experienced, especially perhaps to teach complex content. What are some of the challenges of using games, maybe challenges with implementation? So what are some advantages? What are some challenges that you've had uh, that you've experienced? And yeah, feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to um, say something or uh, you can use the chat. I see um, we have, uh, the learner has control over the environment and is forced to actively explore the content. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that active exploration uh, resonates with a lot of people in the educational video game world, not being a, a passive learner, but uh, an active one that and the control is interesting, too, because we're going to be talking about flow theory, and that's um, sort of central to the idea of flow. Other thoughts? Give it just a little bit. Okay. Well, I think there's going to be time at the end, too, so we can always come back to um, any uh, ideas and, or questions that you may have. So um, we can go ahead to the next slide and I'll, I'll give you a few of our thoughts on the, on the matter. <clears throat> okay, so when using a video game, um, 
players are sort of plunged right into it. They are immersed or they're enveloped. There's uh, the concept of being there in the situation. So uh, as I mentioned before, some of this relates to flow theory. I don't know if you've heard of flow um, uh, theorized by Mahai Csikszentmihalyi. It's sort of like um, being in the zone. You might have heard that phrase of like when everything's, you know, you see that basketball player, football player, where everything's just, uh, you know, uh, they're completing, uh, quarterbacks completing 10 passes in a row, uh, can't seem to, can't seem to miss. Um, at those times, it looks easy, but um, it looks almost effortless. But actually, someone's using a lot of their challenge, but they're fully, they're, they're fully challenged, and they're using a lot of their skills. Uh, they're fully immersed. There's no distractions. Um, they lose a sense of time, deep concentration, and consequently, deep learning. Uh, some other conditions of flow um, are clear goals and uh, immediate feedback. So when playing a game, students have no need for a manual. The goals are clear. Uh, there are immediate opportunities to apply what they've learned. The feedback is immediate. Um, it's abundant and unambiguous. Um, control was mentioned. That's another uh, condition for flow. Um, some have said, uh, some have had other ideas like that um, people, that the players get information just in time for like as they need it. So that's a powerful way to learn. Um, that one reference up there, James Paul G's classic, What Video Games Have to Teach Us About Literacy and Learning. That is, that is probably the first classic in the field that gives you a lot on like the, uh, the educational benefits of video games, if you, and then there have been a lot of books and, and writings since then. Um, okay, so we can move on to the next slide. Okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about flow theory here. So <clears throat> I already described like the experience of it, but um, the theory part is that according to the theory, your psychological state is predicted or dependent on um, a combination of relative challenge and relative skills. So when um, challenges and skills are both low, that predicts a state of apathy. When challenges, when the challenge is higher than the skills, that predicts a state of anxiety. And then when skills are higher than challenges, when someone has more skills than they even need for the challenge, that predicts relaxation. And it's only when challenges and skills are both high and imbalanced that someone's likely to get into that nice rhythm uh, where time, time seems to stand still, uh, referred to as flow. So applying this to educational video games for a second. Well, before someone even plays a game, there's no challenge, right? So there's low challenge, low skills, per, that predicts apathy. Now, if someone first starts playing, a lot of, a lot of games ha like the ones I'm going to show you have different challenges and different levels associated. So you might start on the first level, and it might seem rather easy. So, you know, the skills... Or your skills may be higher than that challenge, and that's nice and relaxing. But then, uh, video game, you know, then you go on to the next challenge, um, or maybe the one after that, and all of a sudden it gets harder. And at that point, the challenge, you don't have quite the level of skill to meet the challenge. That predicts anxiety. Um, that might not seem like it would cause anxiety with the video game, but when you think about um, different flow a lot of times people think about flow with different sports so take skiing um, you hit that slope that's too icy or too steep you can see how that anxiety really sets in um, so to go from anxiety to flow what do you need to do you need to go along that continuum of skill you need to go from a lower skill to a higher skill so what do you, you practice you practice and you get good you get better at it and then you're in that state of flow where it's challenging but you've developed the skills and that's when you get really into it you get really addicted until you get so good at it you keep playing and playing that now it seems kind of easy right and now you're back in relaxation what do you need to get you know to to start the cycle all over that's right a higher challenge and so you need that higher level or the next challenge. And, um, you know, video games are very good at, unlike a lot of other activities, take skiing or tennis, whatever it is, uh, for those activities, often you have to modulate your own challenge or whoever you're playing against. But video games are very good at giving you that higher level of challenge to keep you in flow just when you need it. Um, okay, next slide, please. All right. 
Um, so first, in this particular study, we used the video game to teach a couple of courses. We piloted it in a numer numerical methods undergraduate course and then uh, ran the full study on a dynamic systems and control course. Again, this is undergraduate engineering. And in dynamic system and control, which is the main study, students learn how to make machines to uh, run autonomously. Uh, familiar examples include automobiles, cruise control, anti-lock brakes, traction control, automatic parallel parking. Um, Control systems play an integral and indispensable roles in modern technology, as you'll see in this video. This video we're going to show um, kind of says it all, so I won't spend too much time on this. But um, Briano restructured his whole course so that the students would race a virtual car around a virtual track and therefore face authentic open-ended challenges similar to the nature of those used by real-world professionals, real-world engineers. Uh, making similar professional judgments without the real-world consequences, right? They don't have to worry about actually crashing up cars uh, with several advantages over the traditional textbook uh, approach. Um, just a couple more slides, though, to set up this study. So next slide, please. Okay, so in this study, um, what we did was that we, in the spring, dynamic systems and control was taught in the regular way from a textbook supplemented with lab exercises. And then in the spring of 2009, year three of the study, we used the video game. And the whole course revolved around the video game to anchor instruction. Um, Briano taught the course both times, so the instructor was the same. And to measure students' engagement, we used what's called the experience sampling method. I'll tell you a little bit more about that after we show the video. So next slide, please. And just before we show the video, just a, a word about the sample, uh, about 100 students in the classes. Um, this was uh, NIU is in DeKalb, Illinois. So uh, what you might expect there, mostly about 60% white, 15% uh, Asian. Um, but the only thing that was a bit different about this sample is because, it's, because engineering courses are very male dominated, only about 12% female and the rest were, were male. Um, next slide, please. And then here's where we're going to pause to demo the videos. And um... In most mechanical engineering curricula, there is a numerical methods course, a course that teaches students the fundamentals of how to get a computer to perform engineering calculations. The textbook we use for the course is thick. It catalogs eight techniques for root finding, eight methods for solving systems of linear algebraic equations, nine approaches for interpolation and curve fitting, five techniques for numerically approximating derivatives, nine methods for integrating functions, eight approaches to integrating ordinary differential equations, and much more, including loads of homework problems for students to solve. There are problems which ask students to estimate the derivative of the gamma function. There are problems in which students must determine where, within a steel ball bearing, the internal stress is exactly half the maximum stress, just in case they wanted to know. At NIU, we are pioneering a new way to teach numerical methods to our undergraduates. We are playing video games. What you're looking at here is the final exam in the course. It's a race. Students had to drive their cars around a track, completing two laps in the least amount of time. And when I say drive, I mean drive in the usual sense. We tell the car how much to turn to the right or to the left, how much to step on the gas or the brake. However, instead of using a steering wheel and pedals to give the car its driving commands, we wrote computer programs to do the driving. Sort of like the cruise control in your car, but much more sophisticated. The computer program students wrote had to sense when the car was in a straightaway so that it could accelerate as fast as possible. We wrote the programs to calculate the optimal times to shift gears. Our computer programs had to recognize all the turns in the track and to calculate the maximum speeds at which the car can navigate each. Students computed the last possible moments of began braking so the car would not spin out of control and crash. It is worth emphasizing that students do not use commercial software to perform their calculations. They write their own software, mostly from scratch. Over the semester, students create and optimize their driving programs to race on a specific practice track. 
On the final exam, though, they have to race on a track that they have never seen before. Therefore, the computerized drivers have to be sufficiently smart to drive through any turn or any sequence of turns on any surface on any track. As you can see, some of the driving programs are smarter than others. But even the drivers that crash are smart enough to get themselves back on track and to continue racing. Developers, developers, developers. They have computers with algorithms that's, that can automatically correct drivers' mistakes in order to keep the vehicle on the road. Computer algorithms inside jumbo jet aircraft provide a means for the plane to keep itself on track. In fact, a modern airliner can land itself. This idea of a machine self-regulating or controlling itself pushes the boundaries of technology further into the domain of the previously impossible. So how do these control algorithms and rules work? It's simple. Of course, that's easy for me to say. I live and breathe the mathematics. It has meaning to me. I see how all the pieces fit together. I see the symmetries in the equations. It's beautiful. Unfortunately, when students look at the same equations, they often see something more like this. And that's to be expected, I guess. The mathematics can be intimidating. It takes a lot of effort and hard work to make sense of it. My philosophy is that learning the material can be a burdensome chore or can be an interesting journey that has purpose beyond getting a good grade in the course. In 2008, I began using a video game called EDU Torx to help teach the Dynamic Systems and Control course. <coughs> Even though EDU Torx has much of the look and feel of a traditional car driving game, students primarily interacted with the game through a software interface I created. Instead of spending countless hours honing one's eye-hand coordination, my students instead spent their time constructing mathematical rules for the virtual car to drive itself. Here's what I got when I asked a group of students to show me something interesting. In this case, they wrote mathematical algorithms that would make the car drive itself backwards. That's a good start. Then when they pressed a particular button on the keyboard, the car would perform a graceful flip turn at 75 miles per hour. How cool is that? And when they push the button again, the car would flip back around. Now this is difficult to do. The maneuvers would make any Hollywood stunt driver proud. And it's learning dynamical systems and control unlike anything you'll find in a textbook. So there's a taste of what students can do by the end of the semester, but perhaps it's more interesting to see how the video game is used to foster learning during the semester. When students receive the game at the beginning of the year, this is what it looks like. The car just sits there motionless on the track. To get the car to move, we have to write simple computer programs in C++. Let me show you how it's done. There's a variable called break that we can assign a number between 0.0, .0 and 1.0. A zero means that one's foot is completely off the brake pedal. The gear variable takes an integer. Here we're giving it a one for first gear. A variable two would put the car in second gear. Assigning a number to the throttle variable is equivalent to stepping on the gas pedal. A value of 0.0, .0 means take your foot off the gas. 1.0 means put the pedal to the metal. We'll choose 30% throttle here. Now we can save and compile our code and we can see how the car responds. So here we are, ready, set, and away we go. Notice the car just went into first gear and it's inching forward just like we told it to. Things are looking really good. And... Oh, we forgot to steer. I guess we're back to the drawing board. Our programming interface has a variable called steer. A value of 1.0 commands the car to turn the steering wheel all the way to the left. A value of negative 1 turns the wheel all the way to the right. 0.0, .0 would tell the car to go straight ahead. Since we neglected to turn right in that previous run, why don't we give the steer variable a value of negative 0.5? <coughs> this is a right turn. We'll see what happens. So we're back in the car, ready, set, go. And notice we turned right immediately, and we're going around in circles. This is not exactly what we had in mind, but if you think about it, this is exactly what we told the car to do. So we're going to have to think about it a little bit more. Let me pause this. I guess we could tell the car to go straight for a while, and then start to turn. Okay, so cool, huh? Um, okay, can we go to the next slide, too? So yeah, this was cool, but... Um, were our students actually more engaged in it? Um, as Brianna played around with this in his classes before the study, he could, he believed that they were, and so sort of sought a, a method where we could capture this. <clears throat> and then, so this, now we transition a little bit from Brianna's research focus to my own, because 
this experience sampling method that we used is something that I've used in, in much of my research. Uh, sometimes they're called beeper studies, but basically we gave all the participants digital wristwatches that were pre-programmed to sound an alarm 30 random times throughout a week, um, three, basically th over three separate seven day, you know, three separate weeks or waves during the semester. Um, and, um, and actually, um, I'm sort of dating myself because these days you'd use a smartphone rather than these uh, di digital wristwatches, but back then it was like 2005, so we still use that. Um, and at any rate, when the participants are signaled, they sort of stop what they're doing and sort of like freeze and like report on that moment in time just before you were beat. Okay, so they, they, they give their location and activity on a little survey, um, their experiences and emotions in 20 multiple choice and scaled items like how, how hard were you concentrating, how interested were you, how much were you enjoying it, and so forth. Um, so you get these little repeated snapshots of their experience, and our beeps were sort of scheduled to maximize the likelihood of it beeping during their homework, which, remember, in the control year, that was going to be just with the textbook, the homework or lab. But in, in the, in the um, experimental years, those homeworks and labs were going to be done with the game. So see, we're, we're comparing the experience when doing it with the textbook uh, to when doing it with the game. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we're on to the results. And uh, let me just set this up for you a second. Uh, in this particular graph, you'll see the zero line, and that zero represents students' average, at least their own average, like throughout the week. Uh, uh, so like that first one was average engagement. Um, now the yellow bars are with no video game and the green are with a video game. So let's look at the yellow ones first. Uh, let's actually look in the middle, right? You'll see in intellectual intensity, which is sort of like the challenge, you know, the importance and challenge of the course is high. It's above average. But intrinsic up to the right, intrinsic motivation is really low. You know, that's w w doing an activity just because you want to do the activity, right? So you get this profile almost of like drudgery. It's hard, but I don't want to do it, right? It's like work. And that's why uh, if you look at the left, the engagement score is about neutral. Maybe those things balance out, okay? Now compare that to with the game. Uh, starting in the middle again, intellectual intensity is almost as high. In other words, it's just as challenging. You've got that sense of rigor to this experience. But what's really different is that intrinsic motivation, rather than being really low and below average, it's actually pretty high above average, you know, very, you know, statistically different than, um, than in the control year. And then overall, if you look at that first set of bars, engagement is high compared to a, a neutral. So it's sort of interjected this sense of, um, of interest or fun into an otherwise very uh, challenging uh, course that maybe was sort of a drag. <laughs> um, okay, next slide. Um, you could also see this on the emotional items. Um, we aggregated some, you know, we asked questions like, are you happy? Are you feeling good? Are you feeling strong? Are you feeling sociable? All these sorts of things and average them. And uh, also, you know, frustrated, uh, are you in a bad mood, etc. And <clears throat> You can see that in the um, uh, in the no video game condition, um, positive affect was low and negative affect was high. So, in a, a positive affect significantly higher in the game condition and uh, negative affect lower. Overall, it was like neutral, but it wasn't this sense of of again the sense of almost like drudgery. Um, okay, so. Let's go on to the next slide because you'll see another sort of dimension to this. Um, we asked uh, the players, the participants, did what they were doing feel like work, play, both, or neither? And here's where you really can see this big difference. Um, so in the no video game condition, uh, when they did their labs and their homework, it felt like work over 76% of the time. By far the most, that was the most common response. When they're playing the video games, the most common response was like work and play. That's really interesting because flow actually has this property of like a work-like and play-like type of engagement. So um, people sometimes use the phrase serious, uh, serious play, just as in serious games or playful work. Um, so it seemed to have that, that property of being able to combine both aspects of engagement. Um, okay, next slide, please. 
Uh, I, excuse me one moment, David. I did notice that there was a question from Joanna on uh, oh. the slide. Sure, thank you. In this particular example, are the learning outcomes the same, or is this a revamp of a course that is out to date? Uh, the learning outcomes. So, okay, I in the next study, which is more or less the same study, but um, the study right after this is going to be on the learning outcomes. Those are the out. Those outcomes are going to be part of the course. Um, the course is not out of date. This course is being taught all the time, but but when it was taught was you know, several, you know, this, this particular study that was back in, um, you know, 2006 or seven. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. I don't know if I, if I totally gripped the spirit, but uh, if I didn't, maybe you can write a follow up question and I'll, I'll get to that. We can discuss it then. Um, is this updating the syllabus? Um, well, <clears throat> I guess you could say that when, you know, he really revamped the course around the video game, so the whole syllabus had to be different because the nature of the homeworks in the labs were different. And I'm not, I'm not, told, not sure if that answers your question, but um, again, we can take up more at the end if you wish. Is that, is that fair? Uh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Um, okay. So in Conclusion, students were more engaged, more intrinsically motivated, had more positive affect and emotions, and worked more frequently um, um, as, as though their work was like, work, was like work and play when doing uh, labs and homework with the video game. Uh, overall, the study suggested that a video game approach can be effectively implemented into mechanical engineering instruction to simulate real-world professional practice and foster optimal engagement in the learning process Flow and engagement is simul um, in simulated practice may be a central ingredient to fostering superior uh, development of real-world competencies um, for those seeking uh, a new uh, profession. So uh, we surmise that flow and engagement is, is exactly what was needed to foster superior professional development and learn real-life competencies. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, I'm going to move on to that study of learning uh, that I just mentioned when I said in the next study where it sort of gets more to that question about the learning outcomes. Um, so in this question, we asked, did students who learn um, the course with the video game demonstrate higher competencies with the course materials in a control group? And did students' perceptions of workplay integration, that is uh, seeming like work and play, um, and skill use during homework and lab activities leading up to the exam predict performance on that exam? And if so, uh, was the effect of perceived workplay fusion and skill use in, uh, moderated by the experimental condition? Um, okay. Um, next slide. Okay, so this maybe gets to the measure of the student learning. It basically was the performance in the course. We used two practice tests that were administered at the end of nine and 15 weeks in each of the 15-week the semesters um, before the students took uh, their midterms and final exams that would count towards the grades. Now, you might say, well, why didn't you just use the, the final exams and midterms? Well, the practice tests are less likely to reflect the effect of last-minute studying than the midterm and final. So basically, we, we did that to make it more about like what are they really learning, uh, and not so much just the effect of cramming for the test. Um, and there were also some baseline measures um, at the beginning of the semester. So um, there was an exam on basic mechanics concepts to assess prior level of knowledge that was used as a control. And also used as control were some other personal person level factors like learning styles, digital game use, engineering interests, and demographic and background information that were um, these were all given by survey and just use those controls. So next slide. Uh, pardon me, before we move on to the next slide, I believe that there's a, a Another question. slightly time relevant question in regards to this particular slide. Um, this, this, uh, this slide and the slide previous, can you talk about how the assessments compared for both groups and was the test group, uh, were they both the same? And that was from Arcana. I apologize uh, if I mispronounced that. Yeah, no, it was exactly the same. I mean, it was, it was that students went through this course, the content was the same. Otherwise, it, the only thing that differed was how they were doing their homeworks and labs. So the, the, the tests were, were exactly the same for both groups. Yeah. 
this was you know so this this was a quasi uh you know quasi experimental type of design okay um so the measures the first one the playwork integration i think we already explained that that came from the item about was it like work play both or neither and we created a dummy variable out of the the answer like work and play that's of special interest to us uh, and then skill use was just how much we're using your skills and uh, the measures of experience leading up to a given exam are aggregated or averaged to use those as predictors for the uh, uh, on that exam okay yep and next slide okay and this is simply the main result of the experimental effect on the learning outcome itself uh, again zero is an average if you take all these people and you know lump them together both the treatment and control so the treatment group did score uh, above average the control below average and the, these were significantly different so we did get um, a significant treatment effect in terms of the learning outcome uh, next slide please now we we predicted that maybe one reason for this was this difference um, in work play fusion and perceived skill use but but were they even different I mean was it even higher in the in the game uh, condition and uh, and both were um, so the work play fusion uh, significantly higher um, students rated feels like play and work much higher in the game condition we already saw that in a sense as well as perceived skill use um, now this doesn't tell you whether they predicted that a learning outcome but uh, if we go to the next slide these were done in multi-level regressions which are complicated so i'm not going to actually show you those but um uh in the in the second bullet you see that uh it was a predictor so the first bullet was just looking at the uh, reiterating the first slide i showed you that there was a treatment and there was effective a treatment on the competency in the course the learning outcome but in the second bullet the perceptions of workplay integration and school use both significantly predicted that course competency okay and then um the significant effect of skill use and competency was moderated by the treatment condition that's just saying not only did skill use uh, predict performance but the effect on performance is greater in those that effect was greater for those in the game condition and then a substantial proportion of the variation on the effect of these perception uh, of these perceptions across students was accounted for by taking the game-based course so the game condition accounted for 25 percent of the total variation in these effects okay next slide please okay so um students who took the game-based course um learned substantially more and developed more mechanical engineering competencies than students who took the game course using the traditional approach one explanation for the superior learning games associated with the game or may relate to the concept of indwelling that students dwelling in the phenomena associated with gameplay supports tacit knowledge development of the mechanical engineering principles so um, serious games like ideatorics present the opportunity for indwelling or familiarity with ideas practices and processes that get so ingrained that they become like second nature so here indwelling just we're just using that as an interpretation of why uh some the students learned more through the game that they became perhaps so immersed and familiar with the concepts that the knowledge became sort of implicit in their performance okay so we're going to move on now to the second game uh spumoni before uh, we do before sorry. we play yep hello sorry to interrupt you just had a question about the previous few slides by from arcana asking uh does this from before does this mean that 25 percent of the students uh more passed or students scored 25 percent more in the game based course uh, or that students scored 25 percent more in the game court uh it doesn't mean either it just means that when you looked at that variation in those predictions like let's say every student has their own like effect because <laughs> it's like within student variation that um 25 percent of that variation was accounted for by the by the condition it just gets sort of statistical but it doesn't actually mean either of those and um, uh, just you know we are approaching the uh, we're almost about six minutes left in the uh, presentation right okay um so um yeah why don't we play that um play the spumoni video then engineering is about designing it is about creating and inventing cool stuff 
Learning engineering, getting a degree in engineering, is like learning anything big and worthwhile. It takes a lot of work, even some crashing and burning from time to time. The things that engineers create obey the laws of physics, and physics, of course, is expressed in the language of mathematics. So what distinguishes an engineer from, say, your Uncle Ernie and the masterpieces he creates? Well, engineers are able to put that math and physics to use. They analyze and optimize as they synthesize. Learning engineering is sometimes like drinking from a fire hose. You get blasted with equations and mathematical manipulations. But the best way to learn this material is to dive in and to do it, to get lots of practice. The good news is that textbooks are filled with homework problems like these for students to practice on. The bad news is that textbooks are filled with homework problems like these. While such homework problems have their place, engineering is not about getting some right answer in the back of a book. Engineering is about getting things to work. And think about it, what if homework analysis had actual consequences? More than just a grade. Sounds thrilling, doesn't it? But it'd be good to have the safety of that foam pit when we're learning at least. In effort to replace some of those dull textbook exercises with active and authentic learning experiences, we have been experimenting with a new game called Spumoni. In Spumoni, you pilot a little vehicle, the Spoocraft, around a two-dimensional subterranean simulated world. There are many levels and challenges embedded in the game. In different worlds, the Spoocraft takes on different forms and there are different tasks to be accomplished. pilot your Spoocraft you may use a standard gamepad, but Spumoni is not a game where spending hours of honing your eye-hand coordination is going to help you much. Most of the challenges have been carefully designed to be nearly impossible to complete with one's nimble reflexes and sharp instinct alone. For example, there's a place in Spumoni where if you descend too slowly, <laughs> And if you descend a little more quickly, you break your legs on the landing pad, and now you're toast. As you can see, the window of opportunity is razor thin. So how are you going to beat Spumoni? You'll have to beat it with your noodle, that's how. You'll have to recognize that although the virtual worlds within the game are almost cartoon-like, <coughs> the Newtonian physics are realistic. Linear momentum is conserved when it should be. Angular momentum. Work energy. Particle kinematics. Rigid body kinematics. So yes, to beat Spumoni, you're going to have to make engineering decisions. You must perform analysis. You must express your strategies mathematically and program those strategies into the built-in equation parser or into the C++ interface. With knowledge comes predictive power and the ability to make intricate things work. For example, one can derive mathematical rules that automatically turn on the right amount of thrust at exactly the right time. Making things work, that's what engineers do. Okay, yeah, so yeah, we, we ran out of time, but um, uh, to give you the extreme Cliff Notes version, since we have to close out, um, our study showed similar gains in engagement and learning with the Spumoni game. But then in the most recent study, we had a different kind of study. We, we wanted to know if we could transport it to other 
uh, instructors, one was at NIU and one was at another university altogether. Um, could it be adapted by other instructors? Could they just take these games, in this case we use Spumoni, could they plug it in and get the same results? Uh, and the basic answer was no. I mean, this was the one study where we did not get positive findings. Um, they did not get, they did not find similar learning games. They did not find similar levels of engagement at all. And that raises, you know, basically in this case, raises interesting questions about interpretation. Um, particularly, you know, uh, the question I was going to throw out to people and uh, have people think about is what needs to be in place for instructors to ad adopt, adapt, or reinvent technologies like Spumoni to make it a regular part of their teaching practices, especially to um, to sort of transport it elsewhere. I don't know um, if, uh, if people can stick around, if um, there's any thoughts on that or just any questions. That was going to be uh, the issue that we're going to get at. But um, certainly in the references that I provided, um, you can... Uh, or some of those that are conference papers, or actually all of them, are available upon request. So if you want to request either of those paper, any of those papers from me that goes into more detail about the different parts, um, we have a paper on the transportability study. So if you want to know more about that, which gets into um, implementation issues. Um, also on that, that um, question about the magnitude of the, st of the score differences, uh, one thing I do know more in statistical terms is that the difference was um, in standard deviation terms, it was pretty high. It was like um, like up to a half of a standard deviation. So that was a pretty pretty big difference in terms of the test scores. Um, so since I do have to close out, and it looks like we don't have any questions, but people saying thanks, and we are over time. Just wanted to thank everyone for coming to the session, attending the conference, uh, and thank Carl and the moderator. Um, and I hope this was useful for people. And uh, see you around.